Greetings, friends, and welcome to another ministry of the Victory Hour here on YouTube, brought to you by the Lord's people at Clavel Assembly in Forster, Rhode Island. My name is Jim Gallagher. I'm the pastor at Clavel Assembly, and welcome to our YouTube channel. You can contact me, info at clavelassembly.com. And our website is clavelassembly.com. Okay. Now, we're in the ser this series, <clears throat> Teaching, showing you that the Bible teaches consistently and universally that Christ would return within the lifetime of that first gen century generation to whom he ministered. And we've seen this in passage after passage after passage. Now, I've shown you a bunch where Jesus has said it. And then I showed you where John the Baptist said it. And then just this last posting we had, I showed you where the Apostle Paul has been saying it. And these things just cannot be denied. They're, they're to be found everywhere. What did I give you here? Now, I got I to, gotta, did I mark it down? I got to remember which verses I, <laughs> I gave to you. I should have looked that up. Um, oh, I know. It was Colossians, yeah, Colossians 1, 23. And that bore into Matthew 24, 14. Yeah, math, uh, Romans 16, 25 to 26. Colossians 1, 5 to 6. 2 Timothy 4, verse 17. All showing that the gospel was preached to all the world in the first century. And thus the end can come, as Jesus predicted in Matthew 24, 14. I'm not going to rehash all that. Go watch the last one. When the gospel of the kingdom is preached in all the world, then shall the end come. That's what Jesus said. The New Testament repetitively says that the gospel had been preached in all the world in that day. It had been. It was done. It was accomplished. That doesn't mean there weren't more people to receive it in the years ahead. But within the context of which, what Jesus intended for that, we can't take time to go into that now, it was absolutely fulfilled. We said, we want that context now. No, because that's not what I'm doing. I can't stop and explain everything as I go. Um, and you say, well, that's just because you can't. Can you imagine, can you imagine, let's see, what's an example? Can you imagine teaching engineering, and your students had never had algebra. And you start talking about some of the minutia of advanced principles of engineering, and they say, wait a minute, explain that. Well, you know, you can't explain that level of understanding if they haven't got even algebra under their belt yet. So... They might want a bunch of questions answered. How can this be? But you can't answer them because they're not prepared to receive those answers. You see? That's why we have to learn line upon line, precept upon precept. So my, my goal in this portion of the series is just to show you that passage after passage after passage after passage in the New Testament teaches that Jesus would return in the first century. And all the questions you have about each and every one of those, you're not necessarily prepared to receive the answers. I've got to first show you this is everywhere, so you got to face the music. Then we can go back and uh, deal with some of those details once we get the, the fundamentals of, yes, this is everywhere under our belt, and that's my goal. So... um. All right, so this one's going to be a doozy. It's so simple. It's so simple. And, you know, there's no good explanation for this other than the only explanation that is a good one, and that's what Jesus intended to say and what he did say. Romans chapter 13. More from the Apostle Paul about Christ returning in the first century. Romans chapter 13 and verse 11 and 12. Well, let's see. Do I need to give you more context? 
No, I'll just title verse 11 and 12 be fine. Verse 11, and that knowing the time, now he's writing to the believers in Rome, Paul is, and that knowing the time, in other words, you believers 2,000 years ago, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And he goes on to say we ought not to be walking of sin, in sin because the day is at hand. Now there's a lot there. There is a lot there. Let me just take a moment to, because you know, there'll be people that try and come up with explanations to make this passage unmean what it's plainly saying. Verse 11, and knowing that the time that that now, and, no, and that, knowing the, t- the time, that now, it's not our now, it's the apostles now. And the now of the people, the believers at Rome that he was writing to 2,000 years ago. Now it is high time to awake out of sleep. They were sleeping. When the Lord comes, many will not be ready, right? They'll be sleeping. They won't be prepared. It'll be a surprise. He comes suddenly. Well, they were in that condition then, 2,000 years ago. Now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Now, what salvation is Paul talking about? He isn't talking about their salvation when they received Jesus Christ as their Savior. And they were regenerated, given hot transplants by the Spirit of God, repented of their sins, and confessed the Lord Jesus as the Christ of God, the Savior of the world. When they were born again. Now, they were saved by God's grace through faith, in that moment. That was the time of their effectual call. But that's not the salvation Paul's talking about. Because they already believed. He says, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. So it's not the salvation they received when they believed. It's the salvation that comes down the road after they believe. Well, what salvation is that? the consummation of the fullness of the promises given to them in their salvation, which takes place at the Parousia second coming of the Lord. When we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're saved. But we haven't been yet chronologically saved from the curse of this world the temptation of sin, the struggles with our mortal bodies and our flesh, with sickness, with violence, and all that's in the world. We're still at, well, if we're on this earth, we're still in a battle. We're still in war. But he's given us a promise of salvation, of eternal life, of everlasting, eternal, spiritual bodies dwelling with him forever and ever in his presence with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and Peter, and Paul, for eternity, with all of our loved ones in Christ, the blessed hope. That's the fullness of our salvation. We get the promise of it, and we receive it, and we take legal possession of it through the blood of Christ by faith. But we don't have full possession of it until we go to be with him in glory, which takes place at the second coming. So the salvation he's talking about here is not when they receive Christ as their Savior. It's about when they receive the fullness of the effects of Christ as their Savior, which takes place at the second coming. For now is our salvation 
the second coming, the going to be with him forever. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. It's not the same salvation as when they believe. It's the consummation and the fulfilling of all those promises of salvation when we believed. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. Now, if the, t- the typical paradigm of futurism is correct, then 2,000 years later, that salvation still hasn't come. So, for Paul to say, Our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. And when did these believers in Rome stop believing? Well, maybe like five, ten years ago. But the second coming is nearer than when we first believed. When we first believed, it was 2,005 years away. If if, if Christ came today, it was 2,005 years away. But now, five years later, when I write this letter to the Romans, it's even nearer. It's 2,000 years away. What kind of nonsense is that? That's not what Paul is saying. We can't believe that. Think it through. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. There's going to be, it's going to be relative in time to make sense. Now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is, present tense, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. What day? The day of our final salvation at the second coming of Jesus Christ. When he says the night is far spent, what does he mean by that? Well, we really can't know what he means, so there's no point here. Oh, come on. Uh, sometimes you get a laugh just to maintain your sanity. The night is far spent. In other words, they're waiting. They're, they're in tribulation. They're being tested. They're in a sin-cursed world. The Jews are persecuting them. You confess Christ, you're kicked out of the synagogue. Your family can ostracize you. And some... And some uh, Jewish believers were being captured by men like Saul of Tarsus and dragged off to Jerusalem to be killed. Paul says the night is far spent. Now, to say it's far spent doesn't mean, okay, you went to bed at 9 o'clock, but now it's 9.15. The night is far spent, but the coming... The coming of Allah, to put an end to all this, is still thousands of years in the future. Well, then the night is not far spent, is it? If that's the proper interpretation. I mean, you do see that. The night is far spent. So, if the sun set at 8 o'clock and the night is far spent, that means the sun's about to rise. Sometime soon, because the night's far spent. And the rising of the sun is representing the return of Christ and that final salvation we receive at his coming. Right? Well, if the night is far spent, then it's more like, you know, if the sun's going to rise at 4.15, maybe it's like, you know, 4 o'clock. Maybe it's 3.40. Maybe it's 4.05. Something like that. We're going to use, I mean, the proportions have to mean something. He says, the night is far spent. The day of our final salvation of his coming is at hand. In other words, it's on the verge of coming. It's near. It's at hand. It's in this generation. It'll happen before all those that were standing in front of Jesus in Matthew chapter 16 would die. Some of them would die. Many of them would die. Probably most of them die. But some would still be alive. Because, well, the night is far spent and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. How else are you going to interpret that? How else are you going to interpret that and take care of all these statements made by Paul and do justice 
to the inspired Word of God. I'm telling you. You say, you're scaring me because it's, it's true. There's, uh, <laughs> just exercise faith. Don't trust me. Don't trust me. Trust Jesus. Trust Paul. Trust Peter. Trust the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. If we're saying we're Christians, I shouldn't have to argue for that. If we say we're the sons of Abraham, we should know to do that. Because that's what Father Abraham did. Take your son, your only son, whom thou lovest, Bring him up to the mount and offer him as a burnt offering to me. And Moses knew, but the Lord told me before, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. My son doesn't have any children yet. And he wants me to kill him? It didn't make sense. It made it seem like, well, God's not going to keep his promise. But Abraham believed God, even though he didn't understand him. See? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. That's what God expects from all the children of Abraham. Faith. It is high time to awake out of sleep, Paul said to the Roman Christians 2,000 years ago. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand, which matches everything I've been talking about in this series so far. Every single passage, Matthew 16, 27, and 28, Matthew 10, 23, Matthew 3, 7, Matthew 3, 10, Matthew 3, 12, Matthew 16, 28, uh, Matthew 24, 34, Acts 2, 16 to 17, Colossians 1, 23, Matthew 24, 14, Revel Romans 16, 25 to 26, Colossians 1, 5 to 6, 2 Timothy 4 to 17. They're all saying the same thing. And we're still just scratching the surface. How much time I got? Oh, okay. I still got some time. Let's move on. I mean, this is devastating. No, it's not devastating. It's illuminating. It's not shutting doors. It's opening the doors we need to walk through. All right, so what else we got here? That was Romans 13. I got to mark these down so I remember what I, what verses I've given you. All right, how about 1 Corinthians chapter 7? Let's do that. 1 Corinthians, we're focusing on Paul here. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 29. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. The time is short. What's he mean by that? Why is it short? Because it's coming to an end. Want to hear a little context? Verse 25, Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment, as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord, to be faithful. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. See, they were under tribulation. And it was so intense and so bad, listen to what Paul advises, not as a general principle throughout all time, but because the tribulation and the persecution they were receiving was so strong then, 2,000 years ago. He says, I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. And what he means by that, read the broader context, I can't read the whole chapter, is to not be married. Art thou bound unto a wife, Paul says? Seek not to be loose. He's not suggesting, oh, so it's better not to be married than I'm going to divorce my wife. Paul says, no. No, 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 no. Not saying that. Art thou loose from a wife? You had a wife, but now you've been loose, perhaps, say, through death. What does he say? Seek not a wife. Don't go look for another. 
But it, but you see, this is because of the present distress, the tribulation they were under. Paul would have his head cut off by Nero. Peter would be executed. Tradition tells us he was crucified, but told crucified upside down. I don't know how true that is, but Peter was killed by Nero. Rome, the beast, who worked in cahoots with Mystery Babylon, which was Old Covenant Jerusalem, which sparked Rome to persecute the Christians, particularly after the burning of Rome. It makes so much sense. Art thou loose from a wife in this day of extreme tribulation? Seek not a wife. Don't go looking for another one. Not in this environment. Verse 28. But in, no, he's saying, but don't get me wrong. But and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. You know, the Roman Catholic Church wants uh, all their priests to, 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 to be celibate. And thus the Roman Catholic priesthood is littered with sodomites. And some of the Roman Catholic institutions for the training of priests have become like Sodom and Gomorrah bathhouses. And I got that from the Catholic Wanderer quite a few years ago. They did an expose on it. It's not wrong for the ministry to marry. That's a lie that's not according to Scripture. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, ye shall have trouble in the flesh because of the tribulation, but I spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remains short in what way? This tribulation is going to come to an end when the Lord Jesus Christ descends from heaven with his angels and brings tribulation uh, on those who are troubling you. That's what Paul said to the Thessalonians, and we'll get to that text, not today. That's my time. No, I don't think we will today. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not. <laughs> I got to keep reading. <laughs> and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world have not abusing it. For the fashion of this world passeth away. And the Greek is, the fashion of this world is passing away away. The world is passing away. Yes, you're under tribulation, but don't worry. The time is short. The Lord Jesus Christ will come and put an end to those that are persecuting you. And he, the fashion of this world at his coming will pass away. He'll destroy the all heavens and earth, which is biblically metaphoric language and create a new heavens and earth, which is biblically metaphoric language for the new covenant kingdom of Christ. Maybe that's too much for you right now. I understand. I haven't gotten into that, and I'll teach on that specifically about the heavens and the earth when the time comes. But Paul says, look, you're in tribulation, but don't worry. The time is short. Now, we all know what he means by that. You just got to make peace with it. You got to believe him. That was 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29. Yep, did that one. And we uh, touched on 731 as well. Yep, did that one. What are you going to say to all these, huh? We got to do something with them. They all agree. Don't you see that? We're really going to pick apart all these things and start talking about how no, they don't mean what they obviously say, but there's one after another and after another. Let's keep going. How about... <laughs> oh, well, you know what? Because I mentioned 1 Corinthians 7.31, the fashion of this world is passing away. And the idea that the time is short in 1 Corinthians 7.29, maybe what I'll do is go to 2 Thessalonians. Yeah, we'll do that. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians, 
Again, the Apostle Paul. Oh boy. Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians chapter one. I've talked about this with you for, but not in this context in this series, uh, specifically. But um, Second Thessalonians one, and I, I, it's, I, 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 it's verse six and seven. But I want to back up uh, to verse three. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren. Now he's writing to the believers at Thessalonica, the assembly at Thessalonica, two thousand years ago. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. So that ourselves glory in you in the assemblies of God, the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. The Thessalonians were presently, when Paul wrote this, enduring the tribulation, and it required patience and endurance because it was intense. But don't worry, the time is short. Which is, speaking of their tribulation and persecutions, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye, in other words, this is happening to you, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. See? You're in that tribulation. As Matthew 24 says, the tribulation is in the first century. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense, to pay back tribulation to them that trouble you. It's a, in other words, it's a righteous thing for God to pay back and to punish the people who are now bringing you, Thessalonian Christians, tribulation now, 2,000 years ago. God is going to put a stop to that, and he's going to bring tribulation to them that are persecuting you. Seeing it as a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are, present tense, who are troubled, rest with us. Take encouragement. Be at peace. Rejoice with us, you people that I'm talking right in this letter to. Well, how are they going to rest? And what's going to cause them to rest? Well, listen to this. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, their persecutors, and they, uh, Mystery Babylon, Old Covenant Jerusalem, and even Rome, even Nero would die during that parousia, and that obey in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come, isn't this the parousia, second coming of Christ? When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because of our testimony among you was believed, in that day. What day? The day of the coming of the Lord to put an end to this nonsense of those persecuting his people. He's going to destroy Mystery Babylon. That means it's all in the first century. And if Paul's talking about a future second coming thousands of years in the future. How can he say to these Thessalonians, you who are troubled, don't worry. Rest at ease. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come and he's going to be revealed and he's going to bring tribulation to those that trouble you. But what if Paul meant, but he's not coming for thousands of years. For the ones that are troubling you, they're still going to trouble you. What, what kind of hope, what kind of false hope would Paul be given to the Thessalonians to say, yes, you're in severe tribulation. It's hard. You have to endure it, but rest with us. 
Because thousands and thousands of years later, there's going to be a future man of sin that's going to rise up and persecute and reconstitute the state of Israel. And then Jesus is going to come back and take care of that. And they're like, oh, well, you know what you're talking about. And that won't have any effect on them. It would be a false hope Paul's given them. He's not given them a false hope. He's given them a real one that matches all these texts we've been going over in this series. And by the way, there's so many more to go over. We know we've near done. More next time, because my time's up. Jim Gallagher, reminding you in the words of our blessed Lord and Savior, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free.